if you had a really great idea, wouldn't you want to share it? What if it was an idea that could change the world? That's where I found myself in 2015 with the very first TEDx ACU event, I was able to share that idea, and I'm very thankful for it because that idea is, has changed the direction of my career. In that at that talk, I talked about three things that were critical to the world, the world needed. The world really needed an ability to raise people that live in poverty out of that by raising their standard of living. How do you raise people out of poverty? Well, the simple answer is you can do that if you can provide them with inexpensive, clean, safe, available energy. This graph clearly shows that if you have a very limited supply of electricity, then your standard of living, living is very low. But if you want to have higher education levels and longer life expectancies, the easy way to do that is to provide electricity in larger quantities, and then you'll have higher standards of living. The second critical need in the world is a need for water. While 10% of the world's population doesn't have water to just drink, almost a third of the world doesn't have enough water for basic sanitation. So there's billions of people living without the water they need. And then the third critical need is the need for a cure for cancer. Cancer affects one in two people during their lifetime. And the great news is, is that there actually is a cure for cancer, and it's called targeted alpha therapy. Targeted alpha therapy works and has been demonstrated in several uh, clinical trials. In this clinical trial, there was a patient that had very high elevated PSA levels and was a terminal ill patient, was given a couple rounds of beta therapy, and in those beta therapies, the cancer got worse. And so then this terminal patient that had a couple months life expectancy was given targeted alpha therapy, and the PSA levels went back down to normal range, and after another round, the PSA levels were below detectable limits, and the body scans showed no evidence of cancer. Went from terminally ill to cancer-free. And this is amazing. Doctors refer to targeted alpha therapy as highly specific smart bombs to target cancer cells. There's just one problem with this treatment that, that it limits doctors from using it more, and that's the availability of alpha emitters. You can't actually do this therapy without medical isotopes that emit alpha particles. So when I think about the world's three critical needs, I think about energy to raise the standard of living of people, raise them out of poverty a cure for cancer, and water. And these are needs of billions of people all around the globe. And so how are we gonna address these needs? Well, these three needs have one simple solution that, that can solve all three, and that's molten salt reactors. Molten salt reactors are actually safe, clean, efficient, multifunctional, scalable, and carbon free. So if you really want a new green energy deal, this is the solution to it. This technology will give you carbon free energy. Like any energy source, you start with a heat source, and you need to transfer that heat to a turbine generator to produce electricity. The fluid we want to use here is actually the first key to this technology. It's using molten salt as that transfer fluid. So just like the table salt you put on your table that looks like a crystal and at room temperature is a solid, if you raise that, that salt to very high temperatures, it actually becomes a liquid. And it's a wonderful liquid to use as a heat transfer fluid. And so in this picture, we have salt both before and after it was melted and then refrozen. If you raise the temperature of salt, it looks and flows much like water. But with this flowing water, we can actually have a heat transfer fluid that operates at high temperatures, so we're able to improve the efficiency of the reactor. We're also able to provide industrial heat for things like desalinating water very efficiently. Finally, this is very safe because you don't have the phase transition to a steam, you don't have to worry about high pressures, and so that makes the whole plant safer to operate at. And finally, it's walkaway safe because at the bottom of this reactor, there's actually a drain plug, like the drain in the bottom of your bathtub, but in that pipe, we allow a section of that salt to freeze. And so the, the, what keeps the salt in the reactor is this frozen slug of salt. And if anything should happen, if you lose power to the reactor, if the reactor operators walk away, if their core overheats for any reason, that plug will melt and the entire core will drain into a passively cooled, safe storage system. So it's what we call walk away safe. And then the third thing about the molten salt coolant is it enables the second key component, which is the liquid fuel. By putting our fuel not in a solid state like old technology or old reactors, but put in a liquid state like dissolving your sugar in a cup of coffee, then we're able to have liquid fuel. So the old technology does what? takes your fuel, puts it in a ceramic, puts it in a metal cladding around it, and puts it in fuel rods. 
takes those fuel rods, sticks it in a reactor core, and then when the fission process starts to occur, after about three or five percent of the fuel is burnt and spent, the rod becomes structurally unstable. And so that it doesn't fall apart inside the reactor, we take that rod with 95% of the fuel still in it and we throw it away and we call it trash. We call it spent nuclear waste. Well, it's not really waste, it's 95% of your fuel, but it's structurally unstable. So by going to liquid fuel, we'll go from having very low fuel efficiency and high waste to just the exact opposite, high fuel efficiency and very low waste production. We'll also have direct and timely access to those medical isotopes. So those alpha emitters that the doctors need for targeted alpha therapy, they're produced in this reaction, and we can actually harvest them if they're suspended in the salt, because the salt is flowing through the reactor and we can harvest those in real time so doctors can have access to it. And of course, the reactor core can't melt down if you start with the fuel in a liquid form. So that was this exciting story that I shared four years ago. We were thinking at that time, what if? What if the country embraced this technology? What if? And today, I'm even more excited to tell you about what's next. Next is the Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing Lab. Right here on this ACU campus, we have faculty and students that are working on the solutions to the world's most critical needs. Those are the things we talked about. The mission of Next Lab is to provide global solutions to the world's need for energy that's less expensive and safer, water that's pure and abundant, medical isotopes used to diagnose and treat cancer, while we're training the next generation of leaders in nuclear science. We took, a, we took a phased approach to this project. In the first phase where we were just getting started, we needed to learn what we were doing. So we had a group of five faculty and staff, seven students had jumped on board and started tackling the problem. We did a lot. We designed a molten salt test loop. We took that design that we, we had, we made instruments that were gonna detect the flow rate inside that loop. And then we simulated it with computer programs that were able to simulate what's happening in the impeller, and we studied the salt and how the salt melting point changed as we varied the mixture of salts involved. And then in phase two, we doubled the number of faculty and staff involved, we more than doubled the number of students, more than doubled the lab space, and we started looking outside ACU to external partners to build our collaboration even bigger. The centerpiece of our phase two is the molten salt test loop that we built in the lab here on campus. This is a picture of that loop without the insulation around it. Once we add the insulation, it looks like the picture on the left. We have to insulate it because the entire loop is operating at high temperature to flow this salt in a melted form through it. The picture on the right shows the same loop, but it's a thermal image, so it tells you the difference in temperature. So you can see that, t that while the loop appears in the picture on the left the same as, on the, as it would if it was room temperature, the image on the right confirms that it's at a higher temperature. This is an exciting day for us in the lab. This was the day we first saw salt flow with our, our own eyes. So we had in the loop, we had a little spigot where we turned a valve and allowed that salt to flow in. And the image in the left, you can see that salt start to flow out of the spigot into the bucket. And on the right, you can see the temperature of that salt. The salt's very hot. So while it looks like water, it's not splashing to steam. Even though it's hundreds of degrees centigrade, it's staying in a liquid form. That's what the salt does, and that's why it's so safe. That's one of the safety features of a reactor that uses this as a coolant. If there was a leak, what would the coolant do? It would drip to the ground, it would cool off to room temperature and become a solid. Here that salt is being poured out into a large container to allow it to cool, and you can still see the picture on the left, the temperature of it, very, very high temperature, but as it cools down to room temperature, it becomes a solid again. So, this phased approach. Phase one, we got started. Phase two, we built some molten salt test loops. Phase three is to build a full-size non-nuclear prototype reactor. And very recently, I'm very excited to say, we've announced our phase four. Our phase four plans is to actually build a molten salt research reactor. We're excited about that because of where it's gonna lead us. So, as we pause and we think, from what if to what's next? What could possibly go wrong? Well, <laughs> if we think about what is the biggest challenge to our success, is it can we melt the salt in labs? Do we know how to safely handle high temperature things? Those technical problems are relatively straightforward and we know how to handle those. I think the biggest challenge to this project, the biggest fear I have, is the fear of people scared of the technology. According to a Chapman University study, 36% of Americans fear a nuclear accident or a meltdown. Mind you, we have never had in this country a single fatality from a nuclear reactor. Yet 36% of Americans, according to this study, live in fear of that. That's shocking that people fear something that actually has never happened. 
but it's worth thinking about. How can we remove that fear? How can we overcome that fear? Well, one way of overcoming it is we could, use, we could do the same thing that the medical field did and just try to rename it. Uh, long ago, the, there's uh, scientists that developed an instrument that can look inside your body without a doctor having to cut you open. And, he, and that was a very powerful tool because it looked at the nuclear magnetic resonance of the atoms inside your body. Yeah, it, nuclear. And so it was an NMR. And so when a doctor told a patient to go get an NMR, people were scared of the nuclear word. And so they decided, just, let's just drop it. Let's refer to this as an MRI. So now millions of people go get an MRI and they're not scared of it at all. So you could rename it, you could hide it. Maybe we call it instead of a reactor, what if we called it a molten salt stove? Would that be less offensive? <laughs> I think there's a better solution and I think that's just to understand it. And so let me talk to you a little bit about it. So we asked the question, is nuclear power safe? And let's start by addressing the elephant in the room. For many people, the image you have in your head is maybe Chernobyl or Fukushima, or maybe you have some distant memory of Three Mile Island. Let me just tell you, Chernobyl is a design by the Russian government that was a reactor that was capable of producing bomb-grade material, and they wanted to get electricity out for civilians at the same time. That's a dumb idea. It was a lousy design, and it was a faulty design, and it didn't work, clearly. But to compare that to any other reactors in the world, certainly anything we build in the US is, is unfair. That design should be ignored. Now we can talk more about Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Let's talk about those as we go through our questions about is nuclear power safe? The first question a lot of people have is, well, can it blow up? Can it actually have a nuclear explosion? And the answer is no. Uh, reactors cannot have a nuclear explosion because the, the substance inside, the fuel, is fundamentally different than what you have to put into a bomb. So it cannot explode. Second question, will it produce harmful radiation? Again, the answer is no. At this point, you're saying, well, Rusty, I noticed you put harmful inside there, okay? Does it produce any radiation? Yes, it produces radiation. <laughs> but if you're scared of things that produce radiation, then you need to look to your left and right and be scared of the people next to you because people are radioactive. Inside your body, you have atoms that are radioactive that decay, and so you are producing radiation right now, okay? And, and maybe we should talk about items that we're around all the time and maybe that we're a little bit more comfortable with. So let me introduce the banana. <laughs> we introduced this idea of the banana equivalent dose. Bananas have potassium inside of them. About one in 8,000 atoms of potassium is unstable. It's radioactive. It decays. It emits beta particles. So when you eat a banana, you're eating radioactive material, and you're voluntarily putting that stuff inside your body. And every time you eat a banana, you expose yourself to one banana equivalent dose. <laughs> OK. Now, scientists, we can detect that. But what level of radiation can we actually detect? We can actually detect radiation level a million times less than a banana. That's what we can detect. So we're amazing at spotting it long before it gets to a level where it can hurt you. What level does it actually hurt you? To actually hurt you, you actually need to have about a million banana equivalents. That's, where the, that's the lowest level that's ever been linked to any harm, any form of increased risk of cancer. So it literally, a banana is a million times less than what hurts you, and we can see it coming a million times smaller. So let's talk about some other things you do. Perhaps, perhaps you get on an airplane someday. You fly from the East Coast to the West Coast. If you do that, you expose yourself to 400 banana equivalent doses. What about if you go see the doctor and he says you need to have a chest scan? That's 70,000 banana equivalent doses. That's a doctor telling you for your good health, please go do this. So this is not something that's going to hurt you. What happens, though, if you live next to a commercial reactor for a year? There's a commercial nuclear power plant, and you live like half of the, uh, the citizens in the United States live near a reactor. How much radiation do you get? Less than one banana equivalent dose. Living next to a reactor gives you less radiation than eating a banana. So if you ask the question, does a reactor produce radiation? Can we detect it, and will it affect people around you? You can trace it. You can make that measurement. Will it hurt you? No, it's less than a banana. <laughs> Will it release harmful waste into the environment? The answer again, no. 
One of the wonderful things about nuclear power plants is it contains everything it does. There's nothing that escapes out. There's no burning ashes that go up a flume. There's nothing gets dumped in a river. So the waste is contained and it's tiny. And I'll remind you again, the new nuclear power, while we're talking about the molten salt reactor, does what? It produces 100 times less waste than the reactor power plants we're currently using. So it produces less of it, it's all contained, and it's easy and safe to store away. So, what about charts and numbers? How many people have actually died in the production of different forms of energy? This is a very crude and rough way of looking at things. On the other hand, it's important. We step back and we say we need electricity, and electricity saves lives, but in the production of electricity, their accidents can and do happen. It doesn't matter if you're mining coal, oil, installing solar panels, or building windmill towers. All of these forms of energy are, are harmful. And so when you look at the graph, study after study after study has actually shown for the amount of electricity we get out, nuclear power is the safest. And I'll remind you, this is current technology, not the newer, safer technology. So it's also worth noting that in the United States, we've had zero deaths from nuclear power in the US. What about, though, research reactors? That's what we're talking about building with Next Lab, is building a research reactor. Well, research reactors, like the 100 nuclear power plants that are scattered around the country, we've got 31 re research reactors that are also scattered around the country. They're also regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, that ensures their safety, and there's actually three of them right here in the state of Texas. One of them is owned and operated by the University of Texas, and you might think, well, it's probably over in West Texas in some abandoned area where there's not many people around. Wrong. The University of Texas research reactor is inside the city limits of Austin, and in fact, it's on the Pickle Research Campus that's on the north side of town, and in a relatively normal-looking building in a relatively normal-looking neighborhood, this is where the reactor is housed. Nothing surprising, nothing exciting, no special um, markings. Another place where you have a research reactor, and this is the MIT research reactor. This is the second highest power research reactor in the country, and it's right across the bridge from downtown Boston. On the MIT campus, which is highlighted in the circle, there's a little pin that shows you right where this reactor is, right on the MIT campus. In the picture, right next to this public road, you can drive up and down, just through that chain link fence in the white building, that's where the research reactor is. It's been there for decades, never caused a problem. So, are molten salt reactors safe? Yes, molten salt reactors have the salt, so there's no flash to steam, so there's no high pressure, so they're very safe. There's no molten salt uh, problem of losing power to the reactor station because molten salt reactors are walk away safe. Molten salt reactors require less fuel to be put in the core, so that starts with them being safer from the beginning, and of course they can't melt down. There's an expert at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Dr. David Holcomb, and he wrote a paper last year and he said, all molten salt reactors will be passively safe and resilient against disturbances. So I strongly encourage you, as we think from four years ago about what if, to today when we think about what's next, I encourage you to choose with me a future based on knowledge and not fear. Thank you.